All right, welcome in everybody for a, another edition of Coffee with John. Uh, I'm honored here to be at the home of and with an Art Deco master painter, Ms. Tracy Dennison. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, Tracy's a wonderful artist. All the art that you see in these shots and all the art that you saw on the clips before uh, this podcast are hers, and they are available. Uh, you can contact me at the email in the link. And enough about all that. Let's just get right to it. We're just gonna we're just gonna find out all about Tracy and her life and, and what makes her tick and what inspired her to make all these great paintings. So so Tracy, why don't you just tell us about your early life? Let's let's get into it. Well, I don't know. I've been thinking a lot about all of that because, well, when I was at the height of the whole Art Deco thing, I just had this energy force inside me. It, it just propelled me to, because I'm looking around at this work and I can't even believe I did it then because I know I couldn't do it now. It was so um, time consuming and the focus, I mean, I didn't have all the distractions of a cell phone and this and that and the other at the time. But I also didn't have much else in my life, you know. It took it all. And I'm glad it did. It was really fun. And some of it was really kind of spiritual and other things that transpired were so weird. Like waking up with double vision one morning. So to your early life, when, when were you born? Oh, I was born in um, 1944. March, born in Pasadena at the Huntington Hotel, it was at one time. <laughs> but my mom and I lived in this little box on DeLong Pre and uh, Vine. And it's last time I looked, this horrible thing was still there. And we waited for my dad to come back from the war. And uh, so I'm um, Hollywood in Pasadena. <laughs> one birth so, you're born in so you're born in Pasadena. Yeah. And then you, you, the, your parents were living in Hollywood at the time or living in My Pasadena? dad was in the war. So your mom was living in Hollywood. Yeah, with her sister who was right over there. Oh, okay. Yeah, and they, my mother used to joke about how they, can you believe this, they had the ice man who would come in with a huge chunk <laughs> of ice and put it in the ice box. It's another life, another world. And, uh, and, and what did you, what did, so your father was in the war. and Yeah, he was a captain in the Air Force. And what did he do? Well, he was a, that's terrible. He was a bombardier and a navigator. I can't imagine anything more horrible. No, it's generally considered one of the worst positions to be in in World War II. <sighs> what a hero he was. And your mother? My mom was a nightclub singer in New York when they married. Um, she <laughs> sang at a place called the Zebra Club <laughs> um, or Room. The only thing I ever found about it online or whatever, uh, when I searched for um, anything to do with that place, was I found a matchbook cover <laughs> in a book. <laughs> and then <laughs> all these things get lost in time. Did she ever tell you tales of the zebra room? That's what inspired a lot of these paintings because she said a lot of movie stars and gangsters would hang out there. And what city was the zebra room? New in, York. In New York. So, so, and how old were you about when she was telling you about these things? Hmm. You know, I think um, probably all our lives we heard some stories, and, you know, just fun things. She was a fun person and she got a kick out of that. So it wasn't just, um, anyway. So, so, so sort of these tales that your mother was telling you about these swanky New York rooms that she's singing in laid the inspiration in your imagination for your Art it Deco did. worlds. Yeah, it did. And then um, I did this one painting that was very Deco looking and uh, it was just of a lady on the beach, but it had a look. And everybody seemed to like it. And I thought, oh yeah, that was fun to do. And it just took me on this path of some of these pictures that are so complicated now. Really? Do you still have that picture? No, I sold it for one hundred and twenty-five dollars. Wow! What, what what year did you make it? And what year did you sell it? Um, that had to be <clears throat> in the uh, early seventies, maybe. Wow! Yeah. Was that your first? Was that your first complete 
painting of that genre, you think? Yeah, I think so. It was. I, I didn't want to sell the painting or anything, but she was a, a friend, and um, I bought a jacket with the money. <laughs> <laughs> was it a nice jacket? She said, I'm going to have this painting on past me <laughs> and get rid of that jacket. Yeah. Do you still uh, have the jacket? No. Okay. I'm sure I don't, but I have another one that's similar. <laughs> so it lives on. Does she on. still have the painting? Beg your pardon? Does she still have the painting? Um, yeah, she does. And it's hard to even think about selling my girls. You know, they, it, I don't know. It's just the same thing a lot of artists have. And now, you know, you know I've come to a crossroads where I have so many paintings there's a whole series in that closet. Upstairs, uh, there's a 50 paintings in my bedroom closet. That's the kids' books. And what can I do with it all? Well, sell it's them. not doing any sell good them to the public. being stacked. <laughs> yes, so. Get rich. That's what you can do with them. So, so back to the early childhood. So, so uh, dad comes back from the war. Mom was a, a singer. And now when they come back and they're full-time parents, you guys are living in Hollywood. No, um, we somehow ended up in the valley. You know, it's funny. No matter where you go in the world and you say the valley, they know which valley. And there's only one valley. Uh, I yeah. also grew up in the valley. So. It was just <laughs> like this movie, American Graffiti, when I was a teenager. Because we really did cruise. And we cruised Bob's Big Boy on, on Van Nuys Boulevard. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Wait, which part of the valley were you in? Panorama City. That's I, I lived for a year in Panorama City. I went to Chase Street School. What an uninspiring place. Yeah, well, it's basically like a, a quasi-slum as far as L.A. goes. Oh, well, thanks. Panorama, well, I lived there, too. <laughs> <laughs> some, some of the worst formative years of my life were spent in Panorama City. But at least we were better than Pacoima. <laughs> That's not saying a lot. <laughs> it isn't, but it's saying something. <laughs> you know, but it was fun, and you didn't think of it in terms of socioeconomic... No, not when you're a kid. You know, you know you're just living your life as, you, you as a kid where, in the pa valley. Do you remember where in Panorama City you were? Sure. 7906 Peachtree Avenue. Peachtree. I was on Lullaby Lane. That's right. Because the St. Genevieve connection as well. That's where that yes, came in. A, yes, St. Genevieve. So you yeah. lived there for how long, you think? Well, who knows? But I left when I was 18, when I went off to college. Oh, so you went from Panorama City to college? I did. Oh, wow. I went to Stevens College. And... Okay, but we backing up. I remember because you said yeah. you, you, were, you, grew up, you grew up and you still are left-handed. Wow. Yes, and I was thinking about that a lot because you made me think back over my life. And a lot of it started as far as my feistiness and, and standing up for myself was because my first grade teacher tried to make me right-handed. <laughs> I don't understand it now, and it makes make? no sense, but we have a mold here, and you don't <laughs> fit in, little girl, so. Do you remember any of the attempts they made? Sure. She was mean, you know, and I uh, was mean back. I mean, she made me mad, and I remember her name was Miss Munion, and I called her Munion the Onion, <laughs> and uh, I said to her, but I already use this hand. <laughs> it, 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 what types because the, the modern audience isn't acquainted with that era which was stupid a stupid abusive <sighs> era what types of things would they do to try to force you to use the right hand well how about yelling at you in front of the class so that counts for one i don't want to think of anything else i can only tell you that at that time you know my dad was um on the road all the time he was a salesman, and so we traveled. Thank God I got out of Montecito Grammar School and Miss Munion in the first grade because then we moved to Albuquerque, New Mexico, and we lived next to a Navajo reservation. And I can remember um, the Indians, you know, in their um, horse-drawn carts. And, and um, the thing is that nobody cared that I was left-handed. Mm. I have the best thing painting that I've ever done uh, when I was six. And you can tell it is a Native American. And my style was developed then. And hey, I did it with my left hand. And so it was never an issue after that. Once you moved to Albuquerque? Yeah. What, what grade did you move there? First grade. 
So in first grade, I was in Montecito Grammar School, and then we moved to Albuquerque. Oh, okay. And then how long were you in Albuquerque for? Oh, not long. Several years. You know, there's a lot of places that we lived because we moved a lot. And they're just little clips of little things now. You know, and, and when you're in that kind of situation, it's, it's kind of hard to make friends because you're always on the go. So I think I developed a um, more or less gregarious personality to make friends fast because you're just, you know, on to the next thing. So, and um so when you were in albuquerque so were you were you like would you just draw in your spare like would you just like always you were just always drawing and then you were also painting at that age at 11. at 11. yeah i remember that my aunt ruth right there um she gave me a paint by number set i was 11. And I remember thinking, oh, oh, I get this. Oh, I see how this all works. <laughs> and so I was off and running. And I love oil because it's so fluid. And you can go back the next day and play with it. And um, it's kind I love of a the living smell. Medium. Hmm? It's kind of a living medium. Yeah. You love the smell. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah, I do. Um, I like everything about it. I've tried other things. And I enjoy pen and ink and, and playing around with drawing and so forth. And every painting starts with the drawing. Mm. You know, I have uh, that chest of drawers in the um, dining room. <laughs> I don't have any linens in there, folks. I just have drawings, <laughs> a lot of drawings. So well, for me, generally what happens is that I go for a walk. And I have nothing specific on my mind. And it's a beautiful day or not. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, I get an idea. And I develop it on the walk somehow. And I realize I'm so lucky the way my mind works. I mean, it just goes off and does stuff without me consciously really thinking about it. So then I get an idea. I can, I'm thinking of that painting right now. And... I, I just came home, I started to draw it out. Then I, you know, put it on canvas. So you're in Albuquerque. Oh my God, we're back to Albuquerque. Yeah, yes, we're, we're, going, we're, going, I can we're going chronologically you to your life. You know what I remember about Albuquerque? The, my <laughs> brother and I, I mean, we were in this barren place wherever we were uh, in Albuquerque. And he and I used to lie on our backs and watch these massive clouds roll by. Mm -hmm. That's what I remember about Albuquerque is the sky. Yeah, you, you do a lot of Southwest landscapes in your paintings that yeah, I are probably showcased by, you know, that era. So, yeah. so you're in Albuquerque, and then where where do you go next? I don't know. Like where'd you, where'd, you, where'd you go to high school? Oh, well, then we're back to the valley. Yeah, so um, I don't remember when, if we went from Albuquerque to the valley. I, it's just, for me, I've had another, I think we did move somewhere else for a while. Briefly remember another place. Anyway, so uh, then um, it was kind of fun going to Monroe High School. Oh, you went to Monroe High School? Yeah. That's funny. I lived two blocks away from Monroe High School because I lived uh, over in Mission Hills. Oh. That's interesting. How'd you like Monroe? Uh, you know, I really wanted to go to Van Nuys High. And the reason is that it was really central, but I liked the buildings. At Van Nuys. I didn't like that modern, sterile thing that was Monroe High School. Mm. But that was my school. So it was, you know, great. You end up with a bunch of girlfriends and, you know, do all the teen stuff. And um, my dad was really great about giving me um, a nice car to drive. So I had a 57 Chevy Bel Air. Can you believe <laughs> it? Convertible, mint green. And, um, you know, I think that sparked my love of cars because I don't know any other women that are car crazy. I know. Like it's, it's kind of rare. I mean, you, you prominently, fe not only do you prominently feature cars in your paintings, but uh, you have an eye that's on 
par with like the curator at the uh, like the Pan Am <laughs> at the Pebble Beach Pro Am Concourse uh, selection, where it's like all these twenties and thirties big boat, you know, beautiful. You carriages. can't wing it with those cars. You've got to be detailed. But they are so beautiful. I'm still car crazy. But um, you know, and I had a um, an Auburn Boat Tail Speedster for eight years. <laughs> I drove around, drove around Los Angeles, and it was a lot of fun. <clears throat> Except, uh, well, it was a replica, and the suicide doors um, on my side would pop open. Oh, so they actually oh, were suicide God. doors. <laughs> they, pop open, they go this way. <laughs> so um, I would have it fixed, and I would have it fixed when it popped open the next time, and then it would pop open again, and then it seemed like, any bump, it would have pop open. But mm -hmm. I just kept having it fixed. So one day I'm driving down Coenga, which is kind of narrow and very fast. And uh, the, the door popped open. <laughs> <sighs> and the cars are coming this way. They don't seem too far away. And I'm grabbing the door. Arr, I'm holding in. And, oh, my God, I said, I got to sell this. I can't deal with this anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and I missed it. So you know, people would act like I was the queen when I was driving around. <laughs> yeah, rightfully so. You don't see that. You don't see that every day. Uh, so, so let's go. So you're in high school at this point. Have you deter Have you fallen in love with the Art Deco style? Is like, have you like painted the Art Deco style yet? Or like, when, no. does, when does that happen? Like, what are we looking at here in high school? Oh, what are you uh, What are you painting in high school? What are you doing in high school? I'm I'm in art classes. I'm painting. Um, Whatever they tell you. <laughs> no, no, no. They, you know, most art teachers aren't aren't like that. They don't want, it's not like, you know, putting out a row of eggs. Everybody has their own personality. And if I tell you to, um, you know, that I want you to paint a flower and someone else to do it, your personality is going to affect how everybody looks at, or you look at that flower, how it goes through you. So anyway, what was I saying before I... So in high school, so... Oh, I was just doing the art class thing, but, you know, when I got out of, uh, oh, I think it was, I was in my 20s, though, when I started painting pictures of black people. And uh, I think that started with um, a lady in an art class. So maybe, you know, I was taking classes even after high school. And she was this beautiful black lady who... Um, I still have the painting, but it's in a closet. The door fell off in the earthquake. And so I have this seven paintings that I still have of black people, women, women with babies. And um, uh, I remember it. This is what is so weird about everything in art. And, and you know, I, so I had these seven paintings, and I met this lady, an actress named Madge Sinclair. And she was on a TV show, really nice lady. She said, I want to do a show with these pictures. I said, oh, that would be great. So, um, you know, we had a show um, scheduled. And she called me up one day and she said, Tracy, um, you know, I have to cancel your show. And I said, oh, do you want to postpone it? And she said, um, no, she said, you know, a lot of my friends, they just can't understand why a white lady is painting black people. And I said, I get it. I've heard some of those comments from white people. So I understand. So I have seven paintings that I've never really been seen by anybody. I've seen them. I've seen one of them. It's spectacular. Oh, thank you. I think it's great. So, okay, so you go from you're in high school in it's in the fifties, right? Sixties. Uh, sixties. Sixty-two. And so, what? So, what inspires the choice to go to Stevens College? What about it attracted you? Why did you go there? I didn't. My dad picked it out. He thought it would be good for me because um, they had a great arts program. At the time, I thought I wanted to be a dress designer. Hmm. Uh, I was big into that, and I was designing my own clothes and making them, and it was all consuming. 
And you know, one of the funny guys, as an aside, when I got out of um, school, college, and got my first job in um, in that industry, I thought, I hate this. <laughs> the sound of the machines and the, and the guys with the cigars, and, you know, and I was trying to draw, get a line together, and I said, this is not for me. I, and it was downtown in the um, merchandise area, and it was kind of, an, you know, very industrial. And um, glad I got out of there. <laughs> so, so Dad picked out the college for you? He did. And where is it? It's in uh, Columbia, Missouri. It's right next to the University of Missouri. And boy, was that, you know, an interesting place. It was so cold in the <laughs> winter. Wow. But um, I, I met an art teacher there named Mr. Green, wouldn't you know? <laughs> he, um, he said, Tracy, he said, come with me. So we went uh, for a walk around campus. And he said, you know, I wanted to tell you that I really like your style of art. And he said, and I don't want you to ever copy any other artist or be influenced by any teachers. Just basically do your own thing, he said. I said, okay, Mr. Green, I will. <laughs> you hear that, Mr. Green, if you're still around? even Oh, in the ether? yeah. My... She did it. She kept her own style. So what? And do you do? Was that like you don't remember what year that was? Like freshman, sophomore, sixty-two. Sixty-two. He's older. Or that. three, something. Anyway, I was in the early sixties. Now, yeah. had he had he seen like painting of yours or? Oh, he was my art teacher. So you were so. And do you remember what types of uh, painting you were doing, like subjects or anything, at the time? Not really. Yeah, that's fine. It's a long time ago. I really don't. <laughs> I assume we had some um, <coughs> some. Um, uh, specific things to draw it just is blank right now. Maybe I should get hypnotized. You never know. And go back. That's a good back, idea. Back, back. <laughs> back. You're getting I'm very, trying to go very, forward. Very Please sleepy. let me go forward. Well, sometimes you got to go back to go forward. I am always so backwards. We know that. So because... while <laughs> so while you're there, do, yes. Okay. Do they? Did you? When did you? I'm trying to figure out when did you get exposed to the Art Deco? When did it take root in you? That like was it at Stevens College? Did you take a class? Did you like? When did the epiphany for this, this like you perfected? I told this... you, hon, it was when I did that one painting that had a deco feel. I remember the painting, you know, and um, it was just a lady with her. <laughs> I don't know what, it just had a deco look. And, um, and people really um, responded to it. Hmm. So when you came out of Stevens, like, was it in your mind, like, while you're at Stevens, did you just like, flip a switch and start seeing yourself as a, a painter of canvases. No, I so thought I would be a dress designer. Still, all the way through. So after you graduate, That's you thought I you were thought. coming back to be a dress designer. Yeah. And how long, so how long a period was that before, like what happened, what led to the light bulb going off the, hey, I'm a great painter, like I need to paint. What, what, take I don't think that. I ever felt like that. Well, at what point, what led you to the point where you started doing it as your main thing? It had to be in um the early 80s i i just realized you know that i had flipped the switch as far as refining what i did how i did it and i was very nearsighted most of my life so it was good to be really close to the painting and do this very delicate work with um uh, sable brushes and I, it was so all-consuming, and I used to think that I really needed the the mental stimulation that they gave me. Uh, and it was such a feeling of accomplishment when I was, you know, done with a picture. And I wouldn't let I, myself sign my name until it was a denizen. Oh, I was really kind of hard on myself, and uh, I'm glad I was. I love looking at them, and a lot of them have been published, and I hope they are again. I've written poems to go with them. <laughs> if anybody's interested, <laughs> yeah, we're we're going to cover because uh, you you do your multidiscipline, and so the but the paintings are the 
what's up front, uh, especially when people see them, and it's they're undeniably you know masterful. Thank you. So I mean, did did you ever, at what point did you go? Okay, I'm really good at painting. I was painting that picture, the um, Don flight in the dining room, and I you know I'm not sure how I put that picture together initially. But that's supposed to be the first LAX, which I believe was called the Elysian Fields. And it used to be a series of bell towers and hangars. And uh, so I put a classic, a 1930 Cadillac in there with a Sopwith camel that yeah. the guys are working on. And I was doing the sky, and I don't know, it was just so magical. And I never felt like this before or since that God was really working through me and everything. And it was a real high. And I think that's, that's the beauty of art and, you know, what it does for the viewer is one thing, but what it does for the artist is something else. Yeah. That painting is definitely divinely inspired. Oh yeah. Thanks. I didn't even know the story when I first saw it and just, I got stuck in it. I was like, what's going on here? And that's usually when you can tell when you find your, when the viewer finds himself dumbstruck by the thing. Yes. That's why it's still here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not going anywhere. <laughs> yeah. A tough. lot of people like that painting and you know, it was a special experience. You don't have that all the time, but I don't know. It, you know, finally what happened for me was, um, Wow, when I woke up one day with double vision. And, um, you know, I, I, I suffered with that for five years, and it just changed my life. I know I was nearsighted, but now I was nearsighted with goofy eyes, and I saw two of everything. And so, you know, it really wrote the end for me doing the Art Deco stuff. So the Art Deco, you'd, you'd, you'd done all these uh, sort of like high society life, eternal honeymoon. Uh, That's it, eternal honeymoon. The eternal honeymoon that all these scenes, like I've had the privilege of living here and seeing, uh, you know, a lot of the canvases and like seeing the story sort of unfold and piecing it together. And I think when people see that, it's, they're really going to be captured in that because that's really the atmosphere of them all. And you painted over 100, what, 150 of them or something. There's uh, 60, 60 art deco paintings and 42 wildlife. Well, we'll get to those. 17 deco ladies. 17 deco ladies. That's it. That's okay. Like. So, so those come to an end, a hard end, because, well, for one, you painted somebody, and then two, so you get this double vision. And then, so the double vision's hitting, and then what do you just, so how long into the double vision do you make the switch to, like, in terms of the paintings? Because you started painting Almost a different Almost in style. the next breath, because... You know, I, I, I think I kept thinking, well, tomorrow I'll wake up and my vision will be normal. Meanwhile, what I, I have to do is something. So I, um, I painted this picture um, with very um, calming green colors in it. And I plucked poor um, deer in there. And, oh, it was fun, you know, even though I was painting like that. Um, <laughs> You know, and it, it made me feel peaceful, and it's a, you know, really sweet picture. And um, that was my first wildlife painting. So I did number two, and number three, and then before you know <laughs> it, I had 42 of them. <laughs> yeah, the wildlife, I mean, they're amazing, and it's cool because they're a completely different style than the art. They decor. are, I know. I can't get over it myself. They're, they're filled with all these psychedelic pastels. <laughs> palettes like palettes that don't really exist but they kind of do in, in moments and the animals have a life of their own and they're very it's very 3d it's like it's childlike but it's sophisticated it's just a lot of fun <laughs> oh god i think you should write that out i'll have to use it in my <laughs> publicity stuff <laughs> but i was surprised too that i went on such a different path with it all i, I just saw it a different way well yeah literally the universe came in it's like you're going to change your eyes and then you went with it you went with the flow of it and then so you paint those and then eventually so you, so you struggle with the double vision for about how long five years five long years probably yeah. five torturous years except probably the wildlife was. is probably your only respite that was a freak yeah probably painting the canvases is the only time you felt good right yeah yeah definitely i mean i had glasses this thick 
uh, on one side. It was awful. But it gave me a real insight into what people with disabilities go through. You know, not only was I struggling just to walk off curbs and just live a somewhat normal life, but with those glasses and all of that, you know, you see people looking at you in a new way. So I have a lot of empathy for people who come to the theater where I work, you know, and have disabilities and so forth. I feel sort of drawn to them, helping them as a tale. And you know, there's nothing I could do about it because every stupid doctor that I saw said, well, I could fix it, but I need a diagnosis first. And I would say, well, two weeks ago, I was a passenger in a car that got rear-ended. Oh, no, no, it couldn't be that. <laughs> and so I uh, spent most of my savings at the time on other doctors who, I remember uh, one guy at UCLA, oh, I'm going to have a diagnosis for you, no doubt about it, $700, please. And he didn't have a diagnosis. He never came up with one. Oh, man. But he was an idiot, and he hasn't cashed the check, so I, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So finally, I met a lovely lady eye doctor named Dr. Pearson Cody. And I told her my theory, and she said, we'll never know, but it could be. She said, the thing is, I can fix you. And so she clipped my eyes, and my eyes were straight. And I met another eye doctor, and, and I was still moving between having some double vision, and then it would clear up. And that was for a few days. So meanwhile, I had a, an appointment with another eye surgeon. And she said, um, Tracy, you know you have cataracts. But not too bad. But she said, this was on a Friday. She said, I have an opening on Monday. Do you want me to um, fix those or whatever? And I said, yes. <laughs> and she said, I like your spirit. So she put my prescription in my eyes. Mm. And at the age of 66, I had perfect vision. I still, I can see like an eagle. But it flipped me from being nearsighted to being farsighted. <laughs> <laughs> Holy moly. So, um, you know, uh, when I um, tried to do a couple of Art Deco paintings when I had double vision, when I had my operation, <laughs> I could see that the buildings went like that because one I saw lower than the other. <laughs> so I fixed them. You the buildings never know. Up, they weren't up to code. Isn't that weird? <laughs> and, oh, God. So, you know, here I am now. Uh, I know, thank God I had the, um, the wildlife series started because I didn't need to be nearsighted and up close and doing that really detailed stuff. So that was a new sense of freedom. And I'm glad you noticed that they're, they're their own thing with me. And, you know, I just said, God, I don't want them to look like anybody else's wildlife paintings. I want them to come from the heart, from me. Yeah, they do. And, and every one of them is very mystical. Oh. Like they have, very, they have a lot of depth and a lot of uh, lost soul. And, Thank you. Yeah, there's, a lot, there's a lot going on in them. I may have to do some ugly animals soon. I've done all the beautiful ones. Yeah. yeah the ugly animals deserve love, too. You know, if we learn anything <laughs> on this planet. So you get your, you get your vision back. Do you, do you go back to painting once you get your vision back? Like, is there... I never stopped. So you never stopped. So you no. went back to making... So when do you paint the You know what I ladies? did? At, well, I was doing the wildlife series, which I started with double vision. Um, I started my uh, Thai series. Mm. I, I made myself so busy because I couldn't get my vision fixed. Why, why don't you describe the ties to everybody, too? Like, uh, I don't mean to cut you off, but, like, go with that and then describe the ties. Yeah, I can't even remember what sparked that whole thing. And now I have something like 40 ties. They're kind of like uh, things from uh, ties from the 40s. 
And I made up all these so uh, designs for them. And I think it just was so much fun. I kept doing them, and now I have so many of them. And hopefully they're going to be made into real ties soon. That's what someone I met uh, recently said they were going to do. Meanwhile, they are Thai paintings. That they're the silliest thing I've ever done, I'm sure. Yeah, I love them. Maybe I think, not. I think they're great. Thank you. Maybe the kids' um, books are, are the silliest thing I've ever done. Yeah, probably. Yeah, well, I'm the queen of silly. So you paint, the, so you paint ties. Yeah. And then, did, so did, when did you paint the deco ladies? In between. The ties and... You In between painted. anything. I don't oh, remember. So I'd are... have to look at the... Um... Oh, so this got like, interspersed. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you just kind of go with them, like the poems, you know. Yeah, so you wrote, so you wrote, you wrote poems for each of the uh, Art Deco scenes, right? Not each. Each, but most, but a just, lot of them. Just, yeah. mm -hmm. And you want those to be included. You want, you'd like a coffee table book of that, right? Is that, that's like one of the, the dreams? Definitely. And, uh, Oh yeah, so why don't we talk about like the children's book? Why don't you why don't you tell everybody what what's up with that? What's the story? You know, what inspired it? Well, I've always had this insatiable need to be creative, and I never had kids, and I'm sorry I never did. I um, nothing I could do about it. So, of course, I wanted to do a kids book, and um, to fill that hole, I guess, and so I didn't have any ideas. And I went to my mom, who was a nightclub singer, plus she wrote a lot of music. And she was always very creative and busy. So I said, Mom, you know, I would love to do a kid's book. Can you think of anything? Well, she came up with Sean the Leprechaun. And she had this whole thing uh, written out. And so I saw the whole book and um, in my head. And I started drawing out the story according to this poem that she had written which i uh, augmented and expanded on and the first uh, version was pen and ink and um you know i sent it to different publishers uh, you know there was a book that you could find the address and so i made up copies and nobody was interested in uh, sean the leprechaun and the loch ness monster so, of course, I did a second book, and um, that's John the Leprechaun and the Magical School of Fish. So fast forward, you know, my mom died in 1994, and, um, and I guess I was looking, I don't know, you know, I just decided one day I got to turn those pen and ink drawings into paintings. And so I, um, I did, and um, I was off and running, and, you know, in a kid's world, everything, anything is possible. Yeah. And it makes me happy to be in that world. And Sean is a do-gooder. And he has a great friend, Freddie the Frog. <laughs> and I love Nessie. I love the whole thing, you know. That's the whole thing about what I do. You know, when I live or do the Art Deco paintings like that, I'm living there. Because it takes months, sometimes a year or more, or some cases longer than that to do a painting so it's very um uplifting really yeah to be living in a, yeah. a nightclub scene all day <laughs> how you're lounging around in your two big pants and so forth <laughs> but oh, um that's beautiful yeah so now you know i have um these four different galleries plus not only you know i forget i've Got the Deco Ladies and then my Hollywood series, yeah. which was to honor my hometown, which um, it's not a very big series, but it comes from the heart, too. It does, yeah, because as an adult, you lived uh, you lived in one of the most famous residences in Hollywood. I did. I lived in the Villa Valentino for four years. It was supposedly built by Rudolph Valentino, which um, is suspect as a tale of who knows, but um, it was great to live there. It was, it's still there across the street from the Hollywood Bowl. And it is a um, series of townhouses 
around a courtyard. And I was in apartment number one. And, um, <laughs> oh, it was great. Just great living there. And I worked at a uh, advertising agency. At the time, there was a three-story Victorian, yellow Victorian house on the corner of Sunset and um, Ogden near Fairfax and um, called Charles E. Bird Advertising. So I worked there for several years uh, working on different campaigns. Al Burton was <laughs> one of our, our clients. He had a lot of great TV shows for young girls. Um, he was a unique character and other kinds of uh, shows. So uh, anyway, yeah. So Hollywood, uh, you know, draws you back. Yeah, you were you were in the scene for like a lot of the time. I mean, you dated you dated people that kept you, you know, that were involved in Hollywood. And yeah. You met a lot of the luminaries. I remember the story you told me about seeing uh, Blazing Saddles. <laughs> yeah, that was great. And I sat next to Mel Brooks, you know, and um, of course I laughed harder than I even had to, but it was, uh, and he had, I don't know how many times he had seen it, but he was laughing. He enjoyed his own work so much. <laughs> and hilarious. I saw him not too long ago. Uh, he came to the Saban Theater and he brought a, um, um, documentary called "Remembering Gene Wilder." Mm. It was it was it was great, and he's still you know he's in his nineties now, and he's still this hyperactive <laughs> kind of enthusiastic guy. It was great. Well, Mel enjoys his work, and his work is timeless. And yeah. you're working in a more timeless medium, actually. You know, canvases. Um, what what would you say, like? When people are viewing this, you know, from the future and they've, they've they, you know, I, I've seen like what masterpieces you've painted, but the world hasn't seen them yet. But supposedly you know, at some point they will. And I'll come back to this. You know, what, what would you say to people who like are appreciative of your work that something, you know, like in terms of like, what have you found in Art Deco? The, you found something in the soul of Art Deco that like is very inspirational. And, and like, really? Yeah. That's great. I, you know, you don't know what your work will mean to other people. Because you've got to make it first. And you do that <laughs> by, by yourself in your room all alone. <laughs> Who knows? I, I, then you just, you know, then if it makes it out into the world, you just hope people will like it, I guess. Whereas some people don't care. Yeah. You know, they just <laughs> do it because, uh, but I, um, you know, it was kind of like that. But I met this little lady who said, no, you got to get deals going and this and that. And so she got me the uh, Princess Cruise deal. And that was great uh, for about five years. But then she disappeared. And I'm not good at finding stuff myself. I'm shy about boasting about myself until today. <laughs> when it's non stuff. But anyway, um, you know, it was nice to have somebody who could front for me. And um, so a lot of times, this is weird, but a little chunk of money would fall into my lap. And usually it was from something, I didn't want the money, but it showed up anyway, because one of them was from the Dalcon Shield. Not have, that's why I don't have kids. And it gave me the money to be able to do these complicated pictures here for <laughs> years. Yeah. And um, it's like now I don't want to do them anymore. I've said it all. <laughs> you said it all. You painted it all. Your I did. Your, lo your love of fashion. I mean, you got to design all the dresses, right? You got to I did. choose all the cars, That's all what the I love about scenes. them. You got to just yes. fill the frames with all the things you love. Yeah, and look, I even have furniture from the era. You live the Art Deco lifestyle. Yeah, I do. Elegance, minimalism, beauty in its primal form, the yeah. elegance, the power. Right in the heart of the craziest um, part of L.A. Yeah, truly. I mean, people you know, would be hard-pressed to understand this house 
because it is on top of a methane gas pool where um, the um, uh, La Brea tar pits are right up the street. And the uh, um, floor is now going kind of like this. And other things are going that way. Yeah, view, view, and, <laughs> viewers should know we're on Miracle Mile, <laughs> which is like, it's aptly named Miracle Mile. And, but we're in this like weird cultural overlay where we're also on the edge of Beverly Hills. We're also technically in Beverly Grove. We're in this place called Mid City West. We're in this other, uh, there's like two other overlays. And then, yeah, there's the La Brea Tar Pits. This is a 1936 untouched, on, on, on remodeled like a uh, triplex from the original era that, that it's absolutely charming and beautiful and like to, to the era, but it's also. Yeah, it's gone Horrible. through all these earthquakes and all these like industrial it's exposures, and it's still here. You know, and it is now an historic monument. Look, I, you know, I understand why the landlord wanted to tear it down. Um, there's a lot of economic pressure, and we're in the, you know a hotbed of activity right here. And but this is my home, and so I wanted to save it, and I think it's beautiful. So I went to the Mid City West um, Council meetings about four times and fought my landlord who wanted to put up a six story sterile looking building with 11 units. And um, so I, I did that about four times, and each time they told him they voided his project down. And then the last time, that, the last, the fourth time, uh, he was so mad at me that he started to kind of come after me. And the council people told him to never come back. <laughs> so I didn't trust that that was it. <laughs> so I went to the Historic um, Preservation Society and pleaded my case for this building and the one across the street, which is his sister image. And they made both of them uh, historic monuments. And the people across the street are kind of mad because uh, it's harder to sell a building who is protected. But, you know, the way things are, you can only hope and pray that you have uh, extended its life. Yeah. And um, that's what I'm trying to do and fixing things up and keeping it going and yeah. still working here. You hear that, future people? Tracy Dennison made this a historic site. So now that a famous painter... And whatever I end up being, it's preserved here for history. You can't touch it because it's beautiful. Thanks, Tracy. Oh, glad, glad to do it. Glad to do it. Well, I'm looking, I'm looking here. Uh, I think chronologically we've covered all the major beats of your life and your painting and your artistry and your general philosophy of life. Or do you have any uh, last closing remarks? You have, you can take the floor. Do you have any like? inspirational wisdom, any, anything you think we missed, we can go into whatever you want. No, I think uh, I have uh, nothing on my side. I just want to encourage anybody uh, to be creative, to get out there, to, if you have something you want to paint or you've been thinking out of a project, just do it. That's the, you know, the hardest part is starting. You know, when you look at that blank canvas, you know, and a lot of people can't get beyond that. And I would just say, just do it. And so you just, once you get that first thing going, it will flow. So write poetry, paint pictures, take photographs, have fun. Have fun. Have fun. Well, that's it from here. Let's go high five for that. I'm all for that. All right, oh, wait, everybody. You got to high five. High five. There we go. You heard, you heard it here, folks. Have fun. <laughs>